All right, so in 12 four, we're gonna jump right to the law of sines. We're gonna skip over that area of a triangle part um, and just focus right in on this law that we're gonna be using. So first thing that I wanna make really, really clear, law of sines is used for things that are not right triangles. So starting in 12 four, 12 four, 12 five, we're gonna be doing just random triangles. So let me sketch out something that we could be dealing with for the law of sines. So let's say it looks something like this. So something that looks like that, not a right triangle. You can still make all the same measurements on here. So we use capital letters to represent our angles. And then remember, lowercase letters go opposite those angles. So opposite here would be little a, this would be little b, and then little c. So those are all the measurements that we have here. So this relationship that I'm about to write down has to do with the sine of all of those angles compared to the measurements. So in the triangle, um, you've got lengths a, b, and c, and you have angles capital A, B, and C, then this relationship is true. You've got sine A over A. So this ratio, the ratio of the sine of this angle compared to the length of this side is the same as the ratio of the sine of B over little b. So the sine of this compared to the length of this, and it's the same as the ratio between the sine of angle C to little side C. Okay, so this relationship, this is what's referred to as the law of sines. So depending on what measurements you have and what measurements you need, you can use this law of sines because you cannot any longer use sine, cosine, and tangent because we are no longer working with right triangles. So we're going to have to do this new relationship between the two of these. All right, so this is when we can use the law of sines. Um, if we have the measures of any two angles and one side. All right, so if we have angle, angle side or angle side angle cases. So if we have two angles and any side, okay, so it can be the side in between or it can be the side after the two angles. And then we can also do the side side angle case. All right, so if we have two sides and the opposite angle. So it has to be the opposite angle to one of the sides. Remember, it's not the one in between. So it doesn't work for the side angle side case. It just works for these two cases. So this example, let's set up exactly what we're working with here. So we've got two of the angles and then one of the sides. So this falls into one of these cases right here. So if we solve this triangle, what that means is we're trying to find all of the missing pieces. So essentially, we need to find angle N because we don't have that yet. We need to find little q and we need to find little n. All right, so let's start with capital N. Capital N is gonna be the easiest to find and here's why. We know with triangles, all of the angles add up to 180 degrees. So you know for sure that N plus P plus Q is gonna add up to give us 180 degrees. So if we know the ones we have so far, we know that N and then plus P, which is 53 degrees, plus Q, which is 100 degrees, we know that has to add up to 180. So if we know it has to add up to 180, we can figure out what N is. So N would just be the three, I'm sorry, the 180 total minus angle P minus angle Q, and that'll leave us with angle N. So it's gonna be 27 degrees. So like I said, what it means to solve the triangle is to find all the missing pieces. All right, so we know that N is 27. So now we're gonna use the law of sines twice to find the other two sides. All right, so one thing that I want to mention really quickly, I'm gonna, quickly, I'm sorry, I'm going to write this up here. Um, if we swap these and make them the reciprocals, the relationship works the exact same way. So I want you to actually add this onto the law of sines. Because sometimes, depending on what you're solving for, it makes more sense to put the sides in the numerator. So that's actually what we're going to do here with example number two. So we're first going to find Q. So we're gonna use this setup right here, except we're gonna swap these out for P's and Q's. So we're gonna have P over the sine of capital P equals Q over the sine of capital Q. We're gonna set that up. So P is nine over the sine of capital P is equal to Q over the sine of capital Q. Okay, so this is going to end up being kind of a cross-multiplying situation here in order to best get Q by itself. So we cross-multiply like this. 
Um, actually, probably the easiest way would be just to multiply both sides by the sine of 100, and then these will cancel, and then you'll have QL by itself. So we'll multiply this by the sine of 100. So let me plug this into the calculator and show you exactly how that would turn out. So we will have, set up a little fraction, we'll have the sine of 100 times 9, and then over the sine of 53. We can just get that all plugged in. And that gives us something that doesn't make any sense. I think we somehow ended up back in radian mode. Yes, we did. All right. Here's how we change that. We go into those document settings. We change it right back to degrees. There we go. All right, let's try that again. That makes more sense. So 11.1. 11.1 is going to be Q. All right, so we're just missing one piece, and that's N. So we're going to do the same setup that we just did, except we're going to use P and N instead of P and Q. So we still start with this. So little p over the sine of capital P is equal to little n over the sine of capital N. All right, so we're going to do the exact same thing to get the n by itself. We're going to multiply both sides by the sine of 27. And if we do that, these will cancel. We multiply that in. So let's plug that into the calculator. So we open up a little fraction. We're going to have the sine of 27 times 9, and then over the sine of 53. And that is 5.1. Oops, you can't see that. There we go. 5.1 would be that last measurement. Okay, so one thing we should always be checking is how the angles correspond to the sides. So if the angles are in the, the following order, we've got biggest, medium, smallest, the sides should be in that same order. So we've got the biggest side, the middle side, and then the smallest side. So just that's kind of a quick double check just to make sure you're doing things right. All right, so next, it's going to give us kind of a walk through on exactly how we can figure these out. So we've got something that we call the ambiguous case. All right, the ambiguous case happens in this scenario when we have two sides and the angle opposite one of them. So the one we just did, two angles on a side, we've only got one possible triangle. But if we have the side-side angle case, we might have zero, one, or two triangles that are possible. So I'm going to give you guys a step-by-step -step that we can follow. And that's going to walk us through exactly how to figure out what that ambiguous case would be. Okay, so first of all, we're going to find one of the sides. All right, so to find one of the other sides, and then we can kind of compare and see if there should be one, if there should be two, if there should be three. I'm sorry, zero, one, or two. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find that first missing angle. Because right now, remember, we have two of the sides and we should have one of the angles. So we're going to find... the first missing angle. That's going to be done using the law of sines. So here's automatically where we get into the ambiguous case. Because remember, from some of our previous sections, we found that there were two different values in the first and second quadrant that could have the same value of sine. So we're going to check in our second step to see, like, could there be another possibility? Basically, is there room for another angle to fit inside of my triangle? And you'll see what we mean once we actually start looking at some specific examples. Um, so step two is we are going to check for a second possibility. And you will see exactly what that means once we start looking at examples. So now at this point, we either have zero, one, or two possibilities for our first angle. Um, either there isn't room for it at all, that's when we'd have zero. Either there's only room for that one possible angle, that's when we'd have one. Or it's possible that we could have an angle in the first quadrant or second quadrant, that's when we'd have two. So then at this point, for step three and step four, I'm going to write the possibility of having either, either one or two. So then we find the third angle. And I'm going to write angles in parentheses because we might have that second possibility. And then same thing with our last side. So we're going to find our third side, but we might be in a scenario where we have a second case. So I'm going to throw sides in parentheses too. So let's keep this right on the screen so we can go through our cases. So we've got one angle and then two sides. So we're going to first check for our first missing angle. All right, so that's going to be the law of sine set up with these two values. So sine of big Q divided by little q equals the sine of big N divided by little n. All right, so we're going to work through this. We're going to try to solve for N. So we're going to start by multiplying both sides by 8, and then we'll get a decimal approximation for that left-hand side. So let me show you what that looks like. So we've got, in a little fraction, 
8 times the sine of 110 and then divided by 11. So that gives us this, 0.683 is equal to the sine of n. So remember our little inverse sine swap that we had a few sections ago. If we know that this is true, then that means that the sine inverse of this value will give us n. All right, so we got this. So we can take the sine inverse, and then I would say you just go up and, and grab that and paste it so we get an exact value. So we get 43.1. Okay, so first thing we want to do is check to see if there's room for that angle. So we have 110, there's definitely room for this angle. All right, so we have this possibility. Next thing we're going to check is check the reference angle in the second quadrant, which we do by doing 180 minus 43.1. So this would be the value in the second quadrant that has the exact same sign. It also has a sign of 0.683. So let me just show you. Sign of this also comes out to be 0.683. So this is a possibility as well. However, there's no room for this angle and this angle within the same quadrant. So for this one, we only have one solution. Okay, so this one's gonna have one solution. So let's carry on and continue with this one solution. So next thing we're gonna do, we didn't have that second possibility. So now we're gonna find our third angle. Our third angle P, we get by just subtracting these angles from 180. So subtract away angle Q, Subtract away angle N, and we will be left with our last one. So minus 110, minus 43.1. So our last angle is 26.9 degrees. And then step four is to find the third side. All right, so third side would be side P, so we do that using the law of sines. So this time, let's do the sides in the numerator. Okay, so if we have little Q over the sine of Q equals little P over the sine of P. Okay, so all we do to get little p is multiply both sides by this. Okay, so this will cancel. I'm just going to plug this right into the calculator. So set up a little fraction. We've got the sine of 26.9 times 11, whoops, times 11, and then over the sine of 110. Okay, so we get about 5.3. So little p equals about 5.3. So that's what we mean when we say to find, so to solve the triangle. All right, so we've got all of these values right here. Let's solve this one. We've got DEF. So step one is to find the first missing angle. So we find the first missing angle using the law of sines. So we have sine of E over little e equals the sine of F over little f. Okay, so what we're going to do here to get the F by itself is multiply both sides by 9. So these will cancel. Let's plug this into the calculator. So in a fraction, we have 9 times the sine of 52 degrees. And that's divided by 5. So it gives us this value right here, about 1.418. Okay, and then remember we do a little inverse sine thing. Okay, so to find F, I'm going to hit my inverse sine button and then just paste this right in there so I can get an exact value. So this is undefined. All right, so F is undefined. So what that means is that there is no solution. Okay, so that means there's basically no possible triangle that would have these measurements. All right, so let's do one more example here. We've got X, Y, Z. We have our first angle and then we've got two other measurements here. So first thing we want to find is angle Z. So let's set up sine of x over little x equals sine of z over little z. So we start by multiplying both sides by 15. These 15s will cancel. And we'll plug this into my calculator. So a little fraction. We've got 15 times the sine of 28 and then over 9. So it gives me this value, about 0.782. Okay, so to find it, I take the inverse sine of 0.782, and that's going to give me z. So let me plug that in. So press the inverse sine button and copy-paste this. So this is my value. I get about 51.5. Okay, so 51.5 definitely fits in that triangle. There's plenty of room for it. Let's see what the angle in the second quadrant would look like. If I do 180 minus... 
51.5, could be 128.5, and there actually still is room for that and within you know the 180 degrees that we get. So this is our first two different possibilities, so we're gonna set these up. So that's my one possibility. My second possibility would be 180 minus 51.5, which turned out to be 128.5. Okay, so let's start these off. So this is the first one, we have two possibilities. So two different possibilities for Z, which means two different possibilities for Y. So for both of these, we have 180 minus X minus Z to give us this value for Y. So this would be 180 minus X minus Z, and that leaves us with 23.5 degrees for Y. Now we're gonna have a different measurement for Y over here, because we have a different measurement for Z. So here, Y is 180 total, minus 28 for X, minus this value for Z, so that'll give us a different measurement for Y. So 180 minus X, minus this measurement for Z, and that gives us 100.5. Okay, so two different values of Y means two different values of little y, so finally we can do law of sines to find that last little side measurement. Okay, so we're gonna do little x over the sine of x equals little y over the sine of y. Okay, so for this one to get little y by itself, we're gonna multiply both sides by the sine of 23.5. Okay, so here this will cancel, and then I just plug this whole thing in to get little y. So a little fraction here, I have the sine of 23.5 times nine, and then over the sine of 28. Okay, so this gives me about 7.6 for this version of little y. And then here, smaller angle means smaller side. Here I'm gonna have a side that's much bigger than 7.6 because my angle is much bigger. So let's set this up. So little x over the sine of x equals little y over the sine of y. So this one's definitely gonna be bigger. Same step though, we still multiply both sides by this. And I'm gonna plug it into my calculator. So plug this thing in. I'm actually just gonna copy and paste this and change this angle to 100.5. So that gives me 18.8, .8, so definitely a much bigger side length. So those are by two different possible triangles. Remember, you're always checking to see what the second quadrant, because here's a first angle, or first quadrant angle Z, here's a second quadrant angle Z. Make sure you check to see where your possibilities are. Um, and I'm gonna cut example four just because of time.